recording. So um, hello everyone and um, welcome to our 200th Friday Hacks. Uh, it's been nine years since uh, we had our first Friday Hack and we're very excited to have our two talks today. Uh, the first one's gonna be uh, No Code, the future of software development given by Edward Hutchins from ThoughtWorks. And the second one is gonna be uh, Ted Lin Tu, the CEO and co-founder of Traverse, uh, talking about the 10 things he learned at Y Combinator um, at Silicon Valley um, in the winter of 2019. Uh, but before that, uh, just wanted to give you all a throwback as to what happened at the first ever Friday Hacks. Uh, this was on the 26th of August in 2011. And uh, it was just uh, around six people uh, doing their 2103 assignments with the software engineering uh, learning Android and uh, people reading up on the iOS SDK at that point. Uh, this is an era where GitHub was just getting um, started and there was nothing, and the open source community was still uh, nascent in, if you compare it to what it was today. And the biggest uh, consideration at the first Friday hacks was to just uh, work on cool stuff and find a venue, right? And I thought that was quite, uh, quite interesting to discuss because uh, they wanted to find a venue that allowed food and drinks uh, had a whiteboard, had a projector, and is fairly accessible to students living outside. Um, now, we, we do have one uh, such venue today, which is at uh, the U-Town Plaza. But I, I think even via Zoom, uh, barring the first one, we've satisfied the last three, right? Uh, we do have a whiteboard, a projector, and I guess Zoom is much more accessible to students living outside. So I guess we've hit that um, alternative venue. But uh, venue aside, I think, uh, Friday has come a long way. Uh, it was really, it used to be about uh, students coming up and uh, sharing, purely students coming up and sharing what they've done, like working on Haskell or working on a final project. But I think it's meshed into a very good um, and diverse group of people, where there's students, professors, um, industry leaders, um, and so on, uh, contributing their, their own um, views. So I think hackers move from just students sharing their uh, hacks to um, a lot of people sharing the ideas and the hacks. So I guess uh, that's a pretty positive direction we've seen um, in the last uh, nine years. So yeah, uh, this is Friday Hacks 200. Um, and this is the lineup for today. Uh, we're starting with uh, No Code by uh, Edward Hutchins. And just to give you an introduction about um, him, he's a product manager at ThoughtWorks and he was, uh, he was telling me that uh, he hasn't written much code at all um, over the last few years. So I think it's gonna be great to hear from him about no code. He's living the deal here. Um, he has over 10 years of experience working at various industries. And now he's using his experience um, to work at ThoughtWorks and uh, help people and consult people and uh, make, help them optimize their businesses and basically help them focus on what they, they can do best, you know, building good systems for their clients, right? And he believes that uh, no code uh, is the best way to do that. Uh, so just to get you all warmed up, uh, there's a graphic about uh, no code. Uh, on the left, we have clearly a lot of code. Um, in if you could recognize, this is my favorite editor, but it's uh, Sublime Text. Um, and the right one is no code at all, right? It just pictures which you can use to some of kind of ideas. And while that might seem very unintuitive to a lot of CS majors, um, I think uh, Edward is best place to um, talk to us about no code today. So uh, Edward, uh, we have the floor. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and then we will get started. Okay, so as I go through this, uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Uh, I will have the chat open. So if there's anything you want to mention as we go through, uh, feel free to drop it in there and I will try to respond as I am going through uh, my talk. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining. Uh, this is something that I love to talk about. It's something that I think is really, really amazing. Uh, and it's something that I get really, really excited about. So I'm really happy to share this with all of you today. I hope you do find it inter interesting. I hope that you are able to take something away from it as well. And thank you for the comment about the water bottle. Yes, I'm glad you got one and I'm glad you're enjoying it. All right, so you probably have, or maybe you haven't, but that's why you're here, because you have maybe heard about this no-code movement, maybe recently or maybe over the last few years. So today I really want to talk about why are people talking about it now 
and is it really the future of software development? So first off, I know there was a little bit of an introduction about me uh, just now. Uh, this is me. I'm Edward. I'm currently a lead consultant at ThoughtWorks. So we work with clients to build software and also coach them on agile uh, organizational transformation and things like that. Been working for about 10 years in IT. Started out as a software developer. So it's been a long time since I've written any code. Uh, and after that, I moved into project management at Digital Transformation Agency. Uh, and more recently, I've been doing product management at startups uh, and before coming to consulting. Um, I'm also super, super lucky. I'm originally from New Zealand, but I've had the opportunity to work in Australia, China, and also the US. I just got to Singapore in August after Circuit Breaker last year, where I uh, came from Beijing. Uh, and so I'm loving it here so far. Thank you so much for letting me in <laughs> to all my Singaporeans. So outside of my day job, I'm also super, super interested into generative art. So the only coding that I do these days is around things like processing uh, and WebGL, if you're familiar. Uh, outside of that, I also love no code because I'm not a super good coder. Uh, no code has really given me an outlet for me be, to be able to express the ideas and build things that I want to build without actually needing to, you know, know how to do anything super crazy with code. Okay, so what is no code? Mike gave a nice little introduction there as well, but I'm going to go over this in a little bit more detail. Uh, and I think, you know, over the last 10 years in my career, I've seen a number of different trends pop up. Uh, there's always something new, whether it's chatbots, AI, ICOs were really big a few years back. And it seems like maybe no code is kind of the next popular term that's hitting the web. Um, but what is it? And I think some of you may not have heard of it before, but I think you've probably definitely heard of some no code tools. So you may recognize some of these logos. You've got WordPress there, Squarespace, Shopify, Notion, and Airtable. All of these, I believe, are no code tools. And even the one on the top left, Dreamweaver, not sure if any of you have used that before, but I think that was probably the first thing I ever used to build a website when I was back in high school. All of these are kind of no code tools. The thing they all have in common is that they allow people with little or no programming experience to create software. It's basically providing a visual way to build programs and applications using GUIs or logic builders, basically just building stuff without actually writing code yourself. And of course, they still require people to be able to think analytically, people to think creatively. It's not like they just build it for you. You still need to be able to piece the right things together in the right way to create some sort of valuable product. And I think that's quite similar to what developers do. The only difference is that instead of creating the code yourself, it's happening somewhere in the background. And I think that's a really important thing to note when we talk about no code. It's not that there isn't any code at all. Obviously, when we're writing software, there is code being generated somewhere. It's just not that you're not really writing it yourself. Uh, it's kind of like if you think about serverless architecture. When you talk about serverless architecture, it doesn't mean that there are no servers. It's just that the servers are not your servers. So no code is similar in that sense. Just because it's no code, it just means that it's not your code but there is code still being generated. So in the no-code space at the moment, uh, there's a lot of different tools, a lot, a lot of really popular ones from something that's like super, super specialized, uh, like Notion, which is really just for like note-taking and documentation to things that are a little bit more flexible and powerful like Bubble or OutSystems or Mendix. And you have a range of things that are quite easy to use and things that are a little bit harder to use. Bubble, for example, you can pr pretty much learn in a day by yourself or even a few hours, whereas things like OutSystems and Mendix require like professional business training for you to be able to build applications in them. There's a lot of different tools in the, in the market at the moment. These are just some of them. And you can do really interesting things with them depending on what you're trying to do. For example, you can build Twitter. 
Now, this is a real application. You can check it out on your browser right now if you want, notrealtwitter.com. This was built using Bubble. It's a real Twitter clone that you can use. You can create an account, you can log in, you can tweet, and it was built in one week. Obviously, it's not like exactly the same as real, real Twitter, but for being built in a week with no code, it's pretty amazing. And that's not all. It's not just web applications that you can build in no code tools. Some of you, if you're a gamer, you may be familiar with Dreams. Dreams was a game creation system that was released, uh, I think, uh, February 2020. So it's been out for about a year now. Dreams allows you to make games using a visual editor. Without writing any code, you can create fully realized games through, a, through your PlayStation. And this is all done without any code, but you're still creating a real fully realized software application. And it gets even more meta than that. You can even make mobile apps without code on your phone using a mobile app. This is an application called Play. You can download it from the App Store. You can build mobile apps using a no-code editor to create a mobile app. So there's a lot of things happening in this space at the moment, and I think there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in this space at the moment, but it's not necessarily a very new topic. Back in 1982, this guy, James Martin, he wrote this book, and he said in this book, the number of programmers available per computer is shrinking so fast that most computers in the future must be put to work, at least in part without programmers. So I'm assuming most of the people on this call were not working in IT in the 80s or the 90s, but you may have learned about this in your software development history classes. Around the 80s and 90s, there were these things called fourth generation programming languages that came out, or 4GL, as well as computer assistant, uh, computer assisted software engineering or case tools. These kind of tools were trying to promote this idea of developing software without code but they didn't really take off back then. And I don't think that it's because the idea was necessarily wrong. I just think that the timing was off and the technology that they had available to them at that time just wasn't good enough. So if this is something that is not really new, why over the last five to 10 years has there been a lot more interest in this area? Even if you do a quick Google search about no code, you'll see that there are a lot of articles written about how no code is the future of software development. And you'll see a lot of them similar, similar titles to the title of my talk today as well. It's something that is quite trendy. If you look at the dates on most of these articles as well, 2018, 2020, 2020, 2020, a lot of big names as well publishing these articles. So if it's not a new thing, why is everyone interested now? So I think there are a lot of big changes happening that are kind of triggering this growth and interest. One, advancements in technology, especially cloud, changing expectations of the workforce and also consumers, and also economic downturn. Basically more people wanna do more, businesses wanna do more with less resources. So I'll talk about a couple of these things and show a bit of stats to kind of help you understand what is triggering this interest in no code now and why is it kind of becoming more and more important for businesses. Over the last few years, you know, we've seen huge changes in what technology can do, especially in terms of infrastructure with the rise of cloud. It basically means that a lot of companies that before weren't able to get the infrastructure they require to really scale their organization can do that really, really easily without any big upfront costs. They basically pay as they go. That change, that democratization of infrastructure has allowed a lot of companies to be able to scale or do things that they wouldn't usually be able to do. This has really helped the no-code movement grow because a lot of no-code platforms are offered as platforms as a service. You can build something and deploy it to the internet without having to worry about infrastructure and anything else like that. And over time, as more of these applications are being built, they're leveraging what has been built before and kind of building on top of one another, which is creating this kind of ecosystem of no code applications that can all be used together. On top of that, we have the changing workforce. So more millennials, more Gen Z in the workforce. And in the market, these are people who grew up with phones in their hands, grew up with Instagram, grew up with TikTok. 
these kind of people expect the same level of customer experience from the applications in the market that they do at work. You have a lot of companies who have applications that were written like 30, 40 years ago that people are still using. That's literally older than the graduates they're going to be hiring into their business. And it's just not good enough. People don't expect to be working with these old clunky systems anymore. So a lot of workplaces are being kind of triggered to upgrade their legacy applications, figure out how to improve them so that they make them more applicable uh, to this younger workforce. So to try and meet that demand for these new applications, there's this kind of driving demand that businesses are trying to build more, not just to replace old applications, but also to create business efficiencies. So you'll see that I present a lot of different stats in this uh, presentation. Most of these come from Gartner and Forest, Forrester reports. I do have some references at the end if you're interested in reading more about it. But there's basically this idea that over the next five years, there's going to be 500 million applications created. That's more than the last 40 years combined, just in the next five years. And there's just not enough developers to go around. So awesome that you're all studying development because I'm sure you'll find it easy enough to get a job. Because these days, not every, it's not just like tech companies that are looking for developers. Every industry wants to hire developers. Whether you're in finance, whether you're in medicine, whatever it is, every company is using technology and needs to hire developers. And because there's this lack of resources, there's a huge competition that people want to hire the best people. Uh, when I created this presentation, if you look, um, there's about 500,000 open computer science jobs in the US. And the average salary is around $100,000 per year. It's not only hard to hire developers, but because it's so competitive in the market, it can also be really, really expensive to hire developers. And when you're not Google or Facebook, you might not have that much money to be able to hire the best people when it is that competitive in the market. Not only that, but especially over the last year with COVID, we've seen that there is also an economic downturn happening. There's a big financial strain on companies to be able to do more with less. Budgets are being cut. They need to squeeze every last penny out of their resources that they can. So what can they do? They need to build more applications. There's not enough developers. They don't have enough money. So they need other options. So here's the fun idea. Instead of making more people learn how to code and creating more developers, why not just make developing software not require code at all? So you may ask, well, isn't coding better? <laughs> isn't coding better than no code? How can an application <laughs> with Outwriting code built something as good as, a, you know, I think Mike said before, a real application. I mean, maybe real, you know, software coding is better, but I like to think of it like this. Visual development is kind of the next level in abstraction from binary code to make it easier and more efficient for people to create software applications. Generally, and if most of you are computer science majors, you may disagree with me, but generally people are better at understanding things visually. So it kind of makes sense. We moved from binary ones and zeros to assembly, and now we're developing better and more advanced programming languages and frameworks, which help us write or build software in a much easier and more efficient way. And I think this is not just with coding as well, even in terms of how we build software, in terms of the editors that we use. Uh, if you think about like VS Code, which is probably arguably the most popular, although I heard Mike mention he uses Sublime, VS Code is probably the most popular editor at the moment. And why? Because it offers these additional like visual tools to make coding easier and faster. You have like uh, visual search, you can see your files on the side. You also have a comparison editor to when you're committing code so you can easily see what you've changed. 
these visual cues just help make things easier than just looking at pure text. And I think like this idea of shifting away from coding to creating software is really, really interesting uh, and important for us. I also think that there are other benefits as well. When we look at why no code can be helpful, as I was talking about before, we don't have enough developers. So it really democratizes software development, meaning that more people can create software. And it also improves collaboration between non-coders and coders because it gives them a common language to speak in. And it can be, and I say can be, faster and cheaper. And this is not just predictions. This is stuff that's already happening in businesses now. At one point, you know, computers even were only for super, super rich people or like scientists. But now over time, you know, you have one of the most advanced computers in the world just in your back pocket. As technology develops and grows, it becomes available to more and more people. And the idea with innovation here is very similar in terms of software development. As we grow and as we get more advanced technology, more people can experience or have access to those tools. So just like maybe, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago even, it was unlikely that anyone would have a computer. But now we all have one. And these days, we're moving towards a direction where it's not just professionally trained people who can write software, but anyone can have that opportunity. And I think that is a really good thing. For companies, it uh, enables like everyone to be able to create applications. So it's this term called citizen developers, basically non-IT folks who can actually start creating applications necessary for their business. And with that increasing demand that I talked about earlier, that's really, really important because it means companies have like a 10 times uh, bigger workforce that they can use to create applications. And as I mentioned, it's not just a new thing. Businesses are already adopting practices, policies to accommodate for this change in the way that applications are being built. And not just also for businesses, but also for entrepreneurs, creatives. You don't have to know how to code to launch your own startup. You don't have to know how to code to build a product, launch it to the market, get feedback, and validate that what you're doing has some use value to your customers. And I think that's really important in terms of promoting creativity and innovation in our uh, society. I also think it can help with collaboration. Again, a lot of the time, especially in my job as a consultant, a lot of the problems that we see is that the business people and the tech people don't speak the same language. And there are a lot of issues in communicating what the business people want and how the technology people understand it. So by having this new way of being able to communicate, instead of business people just telling developers what they want and it being misunderstood, they can actually show them by building a simple tool in a no-code application being like, this is what I want. And developers are gonna be able to understand that much easier than just listening to their words. And it's not just one-sided either. I think also that it also helps developers explain to business people what they're building, doing showcases, so that they can communicate and understand each other better, which is always gonna lead to better products being built in the end. And of course that can be, again, can be faster and cheaper for businesses to be able to build with. That means that you, know, you as an entrepreneur or a business person or a company can respond to market and customer changes really, really quickly. You can validate ideas very quickly. You can get to your product market fit very quickly. It also reduces that cost to innovate. So you don't have to invest a whole ton of money in some project or idea to understand whether or not it's going to work. You could develop an application in a week and launch it to your customers to see if anyone's going to use it or not. So there's some stats here from um, this case study done by Sh uh, Schneider Electric where they built 60 apps in 10 months, 10 week average development time, and it saved them 253% on ROI, which is crazy. The reason that there's that big increase is because they're replacing all these old legacy applications that they had doing stuff that were written 20 to 30 years ago, which are so complex and outdated these days, it was costing them so much money to maintain that they're able to replace them with simple modern 
no-code applications. So I like to think of it that all of these benefits really allow anyone, any business, any individual to be able to move or create software in an agile way. So will no code replace developers? That is a big question that a lot of people have. And I think no, probably not. In reality, it's probably more likely that AI or robots will replace developers. But I think that's so far away from where we are now, that's probably not the case. However, I think more and more apps will be built with no code. And more people will be able to build apps. But replace, no, at least not entirely. There are still a lot of challenges with no code from a technical perspective. When you're using no code, it's really hard to take into consideration things like scalability, complexity, security, versioning control. And for a lot of companies, it also means that you're locked into a single vendor. So you're kind of dependent on them. What if that company goes bust? What if they fail? What if their infrastructure goes down? You're kind of at the mercy of the vendor that you choose to build your applications in. So for a lot of complex applications or a lot of critical business applications, it doesn't really make sense right now. On top of that, most no-code applications don't support third-party integration. Um, so if you're trying to do anything super custom for businesses that, you know, you have business stakeholders that want to do something super complex or customized specifically to their business, it might be quite difficult. Um, and also it leads to this thing called shadow IT. So when you're working in organizations, shadow IT is basically this idea that you have people building applications who aren't in the IT department. And when that happens, it kind of leads to this ungoverned amount of applications that exist in your company. And that could end up causing you more money than it's worth because you have all these things being built. They're not managed from a central place and it can end up costing a lot of money if nobody is really monitoring and making sure that they're all done in a safe or scalable way. And of course, besides, regardless of these challenges, somebody still needs to build the software that allows non-IT people to actually build software without code. Somebody still needs to build that application. So if no code isn't going to replace development, why should you care? And I think you should still care because although maybe no code right now is really not at a place where it can compete with traditional software development, I think it's still important. There is a huge amount of investment and growth happening in this space. Over the next few years, it looks like on average, there's a 40% growth rate in this market. From Forrester, you can see by 2022, it's an estimated 22 billion market cap. And by 2024, no code is estimated to make up 65% of all app development. These are not my numbers. This is from Gartner and Forrester, so you can trust them. On top of that, by 2023, it's estimated that over 50% of large businesses will have adopted no code into their strategic plan for their software development roadmaps. And it's not just Gartner and Forrester who are talking about these things. Obviously, ThoughtWorks was also publishing articles about low code platforms. You have articles from Wall Street Journal. It's not just tech companies. You have articles from Tech in Asia. You have articles from Inc. You have articles from Forbes. It's something that a lot of people are talking about and paying attention to. There is a lot of interest in this. And it's not just those companies, but even the big tech companies are investing in low code and no code. So the first one there is Microsoft Power Apps. Second logo you see there is Amazon Honey Code. And the last one, Google App Sheets. These, these are these three big tech companies who are also investing in their no code platforms and tools. And I think over time, regardless of where they're at now, if you also take into consideration AI and machine learning, these tools are only gonna get more and more powerful. 
it's like imagine being able to build an app with like drag and drop visual editor and then having machine learning in the background figuring out the perfect database structure or the perfect business logic without you having to do anything. And uh, to be honest, there's also already some tools that claim to do that. I just don't think that they are really very good right now. And of course, you still need developers to be able to write the AI or write the machine learning scripts that are being used. But these tools are only going to get more and more powerful over time. I just want to recap a little bit and clarify that I do believe you should be paying attention. I don't think no code is going away anytime soon. And I think it's going to have a huge impact on the tech space. There is a big demand for it. We've seen that with the changes in tech, with the market changes that are happening and the increasing pressure to build more on companies. There is a lot of pressure for people to adopt no code. And we've seen that there can be a lot of benefits from no code as well. More developers to combat the rising demand for application development, faster and cheaper software development, and even improved collaboration between non-tech people and tech people. And of course, yes, no code is not perfect. There's a lot of things that it cannot do. There are a lot of limitations that it has, but I do believe that over time, it is only going to get better with further advances in technology, with that growth and investment that is happening in this space, it's only going to generate more companies who are building no code apps. And with that, there's going to be more competition, which is going to lead to further innovations in the market. And what is really, really important, especially for me as a consultant, <laughs> is that companies and consumer expectations change. If you have a customer who, who has other companies who are building them applications in two weeks with no code, and they come to you and you say it's going to take six months, who do you think they're going to go with? So there is some pressure from customers in the market to also be able to deliver things faster because more and more companies are going to be adopting this technology and be releasing and updating software in faster ways. However, I do not think it is a zero-sum game. No code solution is not going to replace developers. I think it's more like that they enable developers and they enable people to leverage technology to do things they might not otherwise be able to do, especially in situations where you may not need full stack development, where things like continuous integration, continuous deployment, test-driven development, maybe these things are kind of overkill for what you're doing. No code tools can or may be a good choice. Uh, even according to Gartner, um, even though I said the earlier 65% of application development would be no code, 75% of that is still going to be limited to small or moderate scale applications, usually supporting non-mission critical kind of workloads. So it's not likely that no code apps are going to take over all of the biggest applications in the world, but there are a lot of areas that they can be useful. You're probably not going to be able to build Uber in no code, although as we saw earlier, you could potentially build Twitter. But for a lot of small businesses, they're not trying to build Uber. They just need a simple website that does something super, super easy. You look at Shopify, which is a huge, huge success story. It's allowed so many people to build an e-commerce store without having any coding at all. For simple tasks or simple generic software, no code may be a really great choice, whether it's just doing a proof of concept or an MVP just to validate a business idea before you pass it off to you know, coding-based traditional software development to do the complex version of it, or if it's just doing business automation or workflow management kind of stuff. Or even if it's just like simple web front ends or administrative apps. I think there is a lot of scenarios where no code, no code really, really makes sense. So my message to you all, I think, is don't miss out on this trend. I think it's a really important call out is that we do not believe no code needs to be at parity with hand coded software to be disruptive. It's kind of like if you go to a tailor and get a custom suit made, 
or if you go to the store and buy a suit off the shelf. Both have their place in the world. And depending on your scenario, you might want prefer one over the other, depending on your needs. So I think you should try building no codes into your discovery process, whether that means prototyping or just building an MVP quickly and easily before going on to build the real thing with hand-coded software. You could even look at hybrid models where maybe just the front end is done in no code because you've got that pretty visual editor that allows you to make something pretty quite easily. And then you do the complex backend logic using code. I would encourage you to explore different opportunities to find out where you can use no code to make your software development process faster. As I was talking about earlier with my own, maybe before a couple of people joined, when you think about APIs, you use APIs because it allows you to do something much faster or easier than you would be able to do traditionally. And just because you're not coding it yourself, you're using somebody else's API, it doesn't make it any worse, so it doesn't make it bad in any way. It just means that you're able to do what you are trying to do in terms of creating a product or delivering value much faster and much easier. And I'll kind of leave you with this thought before we go into questions. There's this very famous book by Clayton Christensen. He explains this in his book, Innovator's Dilemma. Typically, disruptive innovations start as these inferior or cheaper versions of existing solutions. But because of that reason, that's why they're kind of Trojan horses in nature. A lot of people dismiss their threat because they don't seem very competitive or they're not good as the incumbent way of doing things. However, because of that, people may not pay attention. And there is definitely going to be niche segments that they do appeal to that launch that they can use as a starting point that can kind of launch them to further innovate and develop until they're unmatched. So I really do think it's something you should pay attention to and think about. Thank you for your time. I think I open up now to questions and I see there's some in the chat already. So maybe I'll start with those. Um, Edward, actually, we do have uh, a bit of time for a demo if you have um, if you have one prepared. Yeah, we'd love to see one. No, oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, cool. Like, give me a second. So uh, I'll just answer this one quick question that I saw in the chat. At one point, do you advise your clients to stop using no code solutions? As you said, no code doesn't scale well, or as usual, as so code solutions. It seems just good to start with no code, realize you're scaling this. So I think um, as I was talking about, I think there are really uh, good scenarios where no code is great. As I mentioned, MVPs or prototypes are such a great way to quickly validate an idea. Once you've validated that idea, you can go ahead and build the full solution with code. I don't think building like a large scale complex system is necessarily something that we would begin with, but it's really great to just simply and quickly validate an idea to make sure that what you're building has some like target market product fit. Uh, once you know that that exists, you can then go away and build the real thing. A lot of companies fail because they spend hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars building software that nobody actually wants to use. So by doing something really quickly with no code, it can make sense just to validate an idea before you go ahead and build the real thing. Um, So I'm going to try and show a quick demo of what some no code tools look like. And excuse me, because it's not really that pretty. Can you still see my screen? Uh, we can only see like a small sliver. Yeah. OK, let me reshare. Okay, so I'm going to show you. <laughs> I'm going to show you two very simple things that I prepared on my lunch break. Um, so they're not super super impressive, but I wanted to kind of show you what some of these tools might look like. Uh, so I'm going to show you something in Bubble. So oh, that's I'm using the free version. 
So what you'll see here is the bubble editor. Um, so what I've made here is a very simple to-do app. And again, this literally took me five minutes. Um, so you, what you'll see on the top left is I have a design stage, which allows me to add things, move things around. I can add inputs, text, icons, et cetera. And then once I add everything that I want to do, I can actually add workflows to this button. So down on my bottom left, you'll see that there is a workflow editor. And so if I click on this, you'll see that when the button is clicked, it will create a new to-do, reset the inputs. Super, super simple. And when my button done is clicked, it will make changes to my to-do. So this will, over here, you'll see that it will change my current cells to-do, complete field to yes. So I'm going to show you real quick what this kind of looks like. Um, when I run it, if it works, yep. So um, eat dinner. Oh. oh, sorry. Let me turn my keyboard on. So let's say eat dinner, and I've got a date picker here. I need to do that tonight. Create it into my list. I have another one, which is maybe make breakfast tomorrow. And what this is going to do is it's going to give me a to-do list with the next thing, next earliest things next in the list. And when I click done, it will disappear. Super, super simple application, right? So I'm going to show you real quickly. Let's say that I don't think this button is very beautiful. I want to change it for an icon. So I'm going to put an icon there instead. I'm going to change it to uh, maybe not an X, maybe like a check. That's better. I'm going to resize that. Oh. And I'm going to place it into here. So to show you how to set up a workflow, really simple, what should happen when I click that button? Again, I'm going to go here, and you'll see that here there's like a start edit workflow. So it's basically like pseudo code. When this, uh, when this check circle is clicked, I want to do an action. So you'll see that there's a tons of different actions that I could do. Could be sign up, login, and I don't have to code those sign up or login functions. They already exist out of the box. What I want to do for this specific button click is I want to make changes to a thing. So then it will ask me, what is the thing that you want to change? And I already have created a to do uh, item or item type. So I want to change the current cells to do. And I want to change one of the fields, the complete field. I want to change it to yes. So it's super, super simple, literally takes less than a minute. And I've got a function which will allow me to, again, once again, if I go back to my preview, I can add in a new to-do list, go to bed, tonight. And now instead of that button, I've got this beautiful check. And when I click it, it goes away. Super, super simple, super, super easy. Rather than having to do any code, I literally did that in like two, two, I don't know, not a long time. Um, another one that I have here, sorry, is a gift wallet. So this one is maybe a little bit more complex because it's using third party APIs. So I've already kind of pre established this. Again, I did it earlier uh, today. What do you want to find? I've got the Giphy API plugged in here. So I'm going to say I want to find hello. And then I want to add a hello GIF to my GIF wallet, which is my saved GIFs up here. So let's add hey you and this one. And you'll see that they've been added to my saved GIFs up the top here. 
So this is just really, again, simple. I wanted to demonstrate how, well, again, you didn't see me do this, <laughs> but how easy it is to kind of also set up plugins. So you'll see I have a Giphy plugin here. I just put in my API key, and then I can start using the Giphy API using a click interface. You can also see my data. So what I did to be able to save those GIFs to a user's um, profile is I just added a new field. And you can choose a field name and a field type. And I made it a list. So quite simple and easy. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions or wants to see anything else in here. Yeah, I just want to chime in and say that um, I think quite impressive the the grand reveal of um, how you actually make a no code application. I think it was quite funny that uh, you choose a to do app as a as a tutorial because um, I guess even React and most of the JavaScript fan, uh, frameworks have that as a tutorial. And yeah. I was seeing that uh, my first uh, React tutorial was around uh, 300 lines of code, um, and that did take. Uh, a substantial amount of time to understand how React worked and how to actually code it out. Whereas yeah. this took like literally five minutes for you. So it was quite yeah. fun that you used to pick this as your tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the default tutorials that they give you as a tutorial when you sign up as well. But I also thought it was quite funny. I remember also learning to code. Um, you know, you always do like a blog or a to do list or something like that. And like literally, I could do this whole thing again completely from scratch in front of you now in less than five minutes. So I, I didn't know how much time I would have, so I kind of pre-made it, but hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of insight into what no-code tools can kind of do. Um, and I think Bubble is a really great example of a no-code tool that is quite powerful and flexible um, because it's not just like drag and drop interface. You're also able to, again, use workflows. And some of those workflows can be quite complicated. You're also able to kind of manage your data and your databases through here. And you can also even manage styles and create your kind of working style guide for what your different elements look like, all using this single editor. They also have this plugin library, and it has so much stuff in it. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was curious, right? Um, one of the central components of uh, a software engineering education today is about how you handle errors and how you can like recover from an error and so on and so forth, how you design your error handling setup. So easy. Whether, yeah. <laughs> so right now, if I don't put anything in here and I try and create, I haven't set up error messages, but if you want to set up error messages, you can do it with a workflow. But by default, you can see that if I don't enter anything, it will highlight those boxes red. And that's because on this box, all I had to do was check this box that says this input should not be empty. Literally that easy to make sure that you have error handling. If you want to do more complex stuff, like check the format and things like that, there is also conditional uh, checking that you can add in. Wow. Uh, yeah, that is rather cool. Um, and then these new things, right? Since it's so simple to uh, make for literally anybody, right? You don't need to be a CS student to understand how to make this. Um, I was wondering whether you thought, what you thought about the education of no code? Uh, is there a primary direction, the fact that you make uh, a CS student learn bubble, or is it that you make someone who's never done CS before learn bubble? What's the most like um, efficient thing for a company to do? Um, so, I mean, one, I would say that uh, perhaps Bubble, I don't know, maybe not the main tool a company would use, like a big company might use, but I think for a lot of uh, startup founders and entrepreneurs, it's definitely something that they might want to use to be able to launch a business. Um, I think, so I actually have some more slides that I kind of want to mention as well. So um, down here, when I talk about no code, I think it's also really important just to mention low code. Um, I purposely in this talk spoke specifically kind of about no code, but when you talk about no code, it's also really important to mention low code. So the difference between no code and low code is essentially who it primarily serves. 
So here you'll see just a very simple table. No code is more focused at business users who don't know how to do any coding at all. Whereas low code primarily serves developers. Now the difference between no code and low code is that with no code tools, if you look at my editor here, there's literally no way for me to go back and like edit the backend code. There's no escape hatch that can allow me to go behind the scenes and edit things. Whereas with low code tools, most of the time what they offer is kind of like a drag and drop interface to augment the code development process. So you can still actually go in and write code. So if you remember at the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned Mendex and OutSystems. They are more low code tools and they're targeted more towards developers because you can actually learn how to develop in those systems but they provide some visual elements on top of that to make your development faster. So although you don't necessarily need to code, it allows you to code, and you probably need to know a little bit about coding to be able to understand how they work. Appian is a really, really popular one that you also may have heard of. Appian, Mendix, and OutSystems are being used by a lot of IT departments and a lot of big companies around the world to make small, simple applications that their business uses demand. So I think there is a little bit of a difference there that's worth kind of mentioning. Um, and I think that to your question about would a business get their developers to learn no-code tools, I wouldn't say so because they probably want to use their development resources on the complex and hard kind of business critical type applications because developers are so hard to come by and expensive, they probably don't want to use those people building like really simple like admin apps or things that could be done by a non uh, software developer. Yeah, that is clear it up, right? The difference between low code and no code. Um, and, and I wanted to hear your um, opinion on um, some low code tools that even some big companies are putting out. So for example, I think um, Amazon recently put out a, um, a tool called EventBridge and they're trying to add a graphical interface to it. So EventBridge is a, a tool which people can use to uh, pipeline data, right? So say I have data from my application, I can use it to pipeline into my uh, analytics, for example, right? Or a customer ticket. And even they're planning to introduce a, a graphical means of doing that. So yeah, I, I, I do, um, sort of buy into your thesis that um, no code is getting really big now and it's really accessible to anyone yeah. at all. So I think the biggest ones, like uh, you mentioned something from Amazon, but I think probably, uh, I mean, the Amazon tool that I mentioned is Amazon Honeycode. It was released last year. It is pretty much a no code tool from Amazon. You can see kind of here what it does. It has a similar drag drop interface that allows you to build applications their kind of market is more towards like business applications, whereas Bubble is kind of more for like consumer friendly stuff. Right. Um, um, and uh, in terms of other applications, I mean, there's so many different things. If you are interested in finding out more, here's just like a very simple list of things that you could look at. Uh, some of them you may know, some of them I just mentioned. Right. Um, thank you so much, Edward. Um, I would wanted to ask the floor if we have any questions for Edward. Um, or you can put them on the chat if you want to. Um, if not, um, I think we'll move into um, a five minute break. Um, and at the end of the break, uh, we'll have a second talk. Uh, but before that, uh, thank you so much, Edward, uh, for your talk on no code. Mm -hmm. I really do, do, do think you've convinced a lot of us that um, it's something you really need, need to look into soon. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, and again, I don't think you necessarily need to learn about it, but I think, uh, I th think it's not necessarily something you need to learn yourself, but I think it is something you should be aware of. And if it does seem interesting for you, again, maybe you're not a good front end developer, maybe you focus on back end, it might provide you a really easy way to build a pretty interface without spending a ton of time doing it. So you can focus on those back end things. So considering how to make it work for you, I think everyone should kind of consider. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Cool, thank you so much for having me.
Uh, so yeah, as I said, uh, we'll move into um, just a five minute break right now. Um, so y'all can relax. Uh, and at around eight or five, we'll have a second talk, uh, which is uh, Ted coming in and speaking about 10 things he learned at Y Combinator um, at Silicon Valley in the winter of 2019. So yeah, stay tuned for that. And we'll start at um, eight or five. Um, in the meantime, Ted, just wanted to say hi. Um, hope you've received a coffee as well. Uh, and I saw you put in uh, a tool on the chat as well. Uh, hi, can, can you hear me? Yeah, you, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, uh, did cool, I pronounce cool. your name correctly? Is it yeah, Ted? yeah, you can call me Ted. It's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, got, I got the OG cha, uh, <laughs> but I can't drink coffee at night, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I will stay awake the whole night. Uh, that, that's unfortunate, yeah. Um, so uh, everyone was talking about the fact that um, a lot of startups are using uh, no code uh, tools um, in their toolkit. Um, have you ever found the need to uh, incorporate this into your workflow as well at Traverse? Uh yeah, I think um, for us, like if you ask specifically about Traverse, then I think it's probably more like the, the link that I, I pasted, Retool, uh, which is not no code, it's low code. And, and probably more specifically, uh, no front end. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so, so it's, a, it's a perfect like um, middle ground for um, being able to, uh, you know, uh, quickly hash out uh, uh, something usable, something tangible for, for uh, most people. Um, um, it may not be very pretty, and but it does like almost everything that you can think of that is typical for modern front ends, and it does it at very high speed. Uh, I think front end is one of the like a uh, high risk um, um, thing to build when you're building it because uh, tiny interactions make the user think or you know give an impression of you. Um, which this thing kind of eliminates, right? But if you do React, you have to set everything correctly. Um, and, and, and things that you take for granted when you use Gmail doesn't work. Um, right. and, and your customers think that, you know, oh, wow, this is so simple and they can't even make it work. Um, so it's, I think it's like that kind of like uh, uh, effect. So we actually haven't used it yet, but we had, we had quite a lot of deliberation on like, should we bother trying it out? Uh, if we have a front end problem or, or to iterate quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you all like, use it to make an MVP or like a dashboard for customers? Uh, I think to date for customers, no, but as an internal tool, it could be quite compelling. So for example, I, I, uh, as the, as a non, uh, uh, coder, uh, would sometimes like, uh, do Figma and mockups and, 
if I have something like read to, I rather just directly use it uh, read to directly Be because uh, at the same time I can code a bit as well. Right. So um, I, I I might as well just build internal tools, internal dashboards, or internal systems uh, 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 directly using this kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it does look like it has quite a wide spectrum of users. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. It has a very like fo big focus on making sure it's not replacing all software, but just the front end, I think. Yeah. It has that kind of feeling. So I think really it's really like dependent on, on, the, on the specific startup. Yeah. yeah, agreed. And it does feel like uh, no code is uh, the new buzzword of CS, right? So CS is always uh, focused on this one buzzword called abstraction, right? And we don't uh -huh. kind of abstract details away. So it looks like no code is the next best thing to abstract away, even a programming language. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so Ted, it's uh, eight oh five and eight oh six right now. Uh, I thought we could move ahead with your talk. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce you all to Ted. Uh, he's currently the CEO and co-founder of Traverse AI. And Traverse is a company that uses uh, supercomputing to find the most profitable locations on Earth. Uh, to build a power plant, right? So they use like a permutation of uh, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, um, and renewable engineering skills to um, find out what's the most optimum place for an investor to actually set up a, a renewable energy plant, like a solar plant or a wind plant, in uh, especially. And uh, Ted graduated uh, from NUS Material Science, so he's an NS alumnus. And he went. He also went to um, NOC with his NUS overseas colleges in Stockholm. Um, and for those who are not familiar with NOC, um, NOC is the entrepreneurship uh, program that um, at NUS, where uh, people can, get, where students can get, get to go abroad and work at startups and uh, really get to know the ropes of how a startup can work and how you, you, you can yourself build up a startup. And uh, clearly it's uh, helped Ted a lot, I hope, uh, because uh, Ted's company, Traverse, which he co-founded, uh, did, uh, go to all the way to Y Combinator uh, in Silicon Valley um, in the winter of 2019. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, Y Combinator, uh, it is a platform for, uh, it is an incubator, or an accelerator, if you, if you could put it that way, where they invite uh, one of the best startups from all across the world to come in, uh, speak to experts, speak to mentors, speak to investors, um, and they uh, speak with them for over three months uh, with the deliberations and iterations and so on and so forth. And uh, Y Combinator uh, runs twice a year um, in summer and winter. And at the end of each summer and winter, they have this thing called Demo Day, uh, where you're supposed to pitch your product in, um, I think, under two minutes, uh, if I remember correctly. But uh, it's a fascinating experience. And here to talk about it all is uh, Ted. Uh, and we're looking forward to his talk today. Uh, so yeah, Ted, we have the floor for today. Uh, oh, hi, can you can you see me? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, hi, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for um, coming down to Friday Hacks today. And uh, so my name is Ted. And uh, uh, today's slide is uh, an overall introduction to um, um, what we do and also like what we learn at Y Combinator, but uh, more more or less the actual purpose I hope um, that I'm doing today is if anyone's in the audience who um, wants to start up and uh, who um, are already have start up, started up and, and, and they want to, um, you know, bring that further along, then uh, I hope I can be helpful in uh, providing some kind of um, uh, experience and uh, knowledge. On, on our journey so far. Uh, so, can you see this? Oh, okay, did the slides change? Yep, it does. Okay, cool. Okay, so so about me and uh, Traverse in general, um, I basically used to be in a private equity fund and uh, we built power plants um, as part of a, 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 a financial institution around Southeast Asia. And we um, invested about $500 million worth of power plants around the region. And one of the primary motivations for starting Traverse is that um, 
um, we paid a lot of um, engineering consultants, like uh, civil, mechanical, electrical engineering consultants, to find out whether or not a particular um, project is profitable or not. Um, and, and, and this could just be a patch of grass, right? And you're saying, I want to build a hydropower dam here. I want to build a wind farm there. And, 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 and basically, it was very um, compli complicated to, to run this engineering process. And the engineering process leads to a financial decision on whether or not you should um, build this project. And it's kind of the same as like renting a room um, or finding a room or, or finding a house. Um, and one of the uh, uh, frustrations was that this process was too long and I wanted to automate the whole thing using a lot of software and using a lot of AI. Um, and that's how I started Traverse. It's actually sort of an engineering platform to automatically uh, perform um, workflows surrounding uh, civil, mechanical, in uh, electrical engineering processes. Um, so you can see my screen. So this was one of the first like versions of the software um, we built, where um, we could uh, uh, find out, you know, like say for example, uh, wind speeds um, across the whole country and uh, figure out which one is a good place to build a wind farm. And um, like we could find protected areas that overlap um, um, various zones on, on this kind of uh, uh, map and then uh, figure out, you know, uh, what, what, what is a very good location with a low risk to, to build these kind of projects. Um, so this was the first variation of the product we built where um, it worked for the, the whole world. Um, but then after that, we iterated a little bit, and now we kind of do something like this, where, um, for example, this is one particular location, and then um, we do it for every single possible location, and then we, we send you a PDF um, that basically summarizes the uh, entire engineering profile, the financial profile of this particular um, uh, you know, uh, 200 kilometer by 200 kilometer box. Yeah. So that's kind of what Traverse does. Um, so to move on to the next slide. So uh, me and my co-founder Eugene uh, started Traverse um, in 2016 or 17 around there. And so for the very first uh, one year, we just worked on the weekends, just trying to get an MVP out. And, um, and after that year, we um, quit um, our respective um, companies then to do this full time. And after that, we spent another one more year just trying to get um, this thing that I just showed you working uh, to actually try to sell this to um, hydropower developers. Uh, that was our initial um, target market. Um, and during that time, we um, I, I wasn't a, a, a coder, I was more in finance and I basically learned how to code and, and I did some back end and Eugene did some front end and uh, we basically um, managed to get this thing running. Uh, and then we actually launched it, uh, got some marketing press around it and then uh, 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 we, we managed to get a, a couple of customers um, um, who were uh, reasonably large uh, financial institutions who wanted to find out, you know, whether their investments, their, their potential investments were going to work or not. And pri primarily after that, um, uh, I think we started with something like, like a, 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 a hundred to um, $150,000 worth of our savings. Uh, we paid ourselves and, and hired somebody. And around one year, one, one and a half years later, we were kind of running out of money. And then um, uh, my friend um, who was also running another startup told me, um, you know, uh, you should you should go try to see if you can apply to YC. And we were like, okay, you know what? Um, it doesn't matter any anymore now anyway. So let's let's try to apply. And uh, we we just applied. So applying to YC is um, um, pretty um, simple. You just fill in an application form and then uh, you submit the form and then um, it, it just uh, they, they, they either reject you directly uh, in about like a month or so, or they just tell you um, you are invited for an interview down to um, Mountain View, California. Uh, and literally, it, it was just 10 minutes. The interview is just 10 minutes. And we had to fly all the way there um, for a 10 minute interview. 
and uh, and it was an extremely intense interview where they they, they ask you like um, two questions um, at the same time and you have to answer immediately and my co-founder would be asked like a different question there were like three people there um, and it was very a very very intense and crazy interview and within the 10 minutes they decide whether or not to fund you and they fund about 150,000 US dollars. Um, uh, for us, it was special where we actually went through two such interviews. And, uh, uh, um, and, and I think both of the, the teams, the, 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 the two interview sets, like three people each said yes. And then um, uh, in, 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 on the same day, they call you. If you don't get in, they send you an email uh, with a nice one paragraph on why you, don't, why you didn't get in. And if you do get in, then they, they send you an email. Uh, oh no, they, they call you. Yeah, so this was where we were. Uh, and after you, you get in, you basically go back to um, Singapore, or if you're, if you're there, you can just hang around there. And then you come back like um, a month later where the actual batch starts. But the batch actually starts on the same day where you start the interview and they wire you the money like two days later. And it's ridiculously fast. Everything in Silicon Valley works at this kind of um, breakneck, breakneck pace. And um, so the day we got in, um, it was around 12 o'clock. We got a call at 3 p.m. There was a briefing. And I don't know if you guys kind of know um, some of these um, people like Michael Seibel and Sam Altman. Uh, Michael Seibel founded Twitch, Justin TV, which sold to Amazon for a billion dollars. And Sam Altman also um, founded uh, uh, this this company called uh, 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 what's this company called the the, the uh, AI company I uh, never mind yeah so so both of them are, are kind of celebrities um, in, in the so-called the startup scene if there is one and on, on that day that we got in there was a briefing the first thing they told us was there's a hundred companies here 95 of you will make it <laughs> so um, uh, yeah so it was a very humbling experience um, some of the companies here were already making like $20 million um, in annual run rate. Uh, other companies were college students, like um, probably some of you in the audience, where um, you just um, got out of school. Um, so there was a, a very large variety and mix. Yeah. Um, so Y Combinator goes on for about three months. Uh, and during that three months, the primary motivation is to raise funds at the end of the three months. But um, actually, we later on realized there was a secondary motivation. The primary motivation is to build your company. Um, although it does end in demo day where you pitch to investors, what really happened was that they, 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 they taught us how to aggressively build your company. Like, um, you know, you have some kind of terminal illness um, 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 the next day and, and, and what to do on a day-to-day -day basis, what to do on a week-to-week -week basis to make sure that you know, you are doing uh, mostly the right things and not doing all the other wrong things that are not important. And, uh, uh, and, and, and this program structure is something like um, every Thursday there are dinners where um, people like the CEO of Stripe, um, uh, uh, people like uh, the Airbnb's founder um, come and uh, uh, give a talk about their personal experiences. Um, and, and, and then on the other days, there are office hours where, say, for example, our group partners were the first employee of Yahoo, uh, Tim Brady, uh, and then uh, Michael Seibel. Uh, and uh, so the two of them primarily um, um, met us for half an hour. And those half an hours are like a repeat of the 10 minute interview, where again, they ask you a question every 30 seconds, and you're supposed to answer really, you know, concise, strong answers. And every week, you're supposed to come back with progress, right? And, and they, we were like, write down together, next week, we're going to achieve this. And the next week, when we meet them, if you haven't achieved it, um, you, you kind of just don't want to go to that meeting. So, so there's that kind of intensity. And then there were also like group meetings, weekly group meetings, where you meet together as a group with other founders. And everyone also kind of has to do the last week, I promised that we'll get this done. And this week, I did or did not manage to get it done. Um, and that, that was a kind of the culture for that three months. Yeah. So at the end of the whole thing, at demo day, 
uh, we raised about two and a half million US dollars from almost all US investors, um, including um, one of the first, like one of our angels uh, was one of the first investors, investor in Uber and Instagram. Um, and it, it, it was on, it closed within like two weeks after demo day, like demo day was on the first day of the month and we closed the entire round in like two weeks. So in general, YC was a really, really crazy experience. Um, and, 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 and it kind of, you know, like humbled us as well as like taught us how um, generally what is the expectation of starting up before that, right? Like there was no expectations, right? It was just me and my co-founder just kind of, kind of doing our thing. And, and this opened our eyes a lot, right? So yeah, so um, that's just the quick introduction. Um, here, I would like to be helpful, more, more helpful than just telling you a story about what we do, what we did. Um, and so here's a sharing session um, about um, uh, you know, what we learned at YC um, as applicable to you um, and also as applicable to the degree that you might want to start up or you might want to um, launch an idea and make somebody um, uh, launch a product and make somebody pay for it. So, so, so like using the word that like you, you want to start up is already too, too much, like it's a loaded word. It, it could just be as simple as you have built something and you just want to kind of um, um, tell, uh, uh, make people um, use it and pay for it, right? And that's good enough. So, so, so that's what I, I hope um, I can help with um, if, yeah. So the first, so there are 10, 10 things here. And then I can start with um, four easy ones. So right now, I think most of the audience um, are, uh, of you are students. So um, this is like the best opportunity you can have to find a team that can build together, right? Like after you graduate, it gets really hard because um, you know you kind of you kind of drift apart and you have a job and and whatnot. So right now is a and 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 you you have to do nine to five work. Um, right now you have an opportunity where, you know, you can look to your left and look to your right and you can find those group of friends to um, go build something. Um, and I think it's quite important that I'm also talking to the NUS hackers kind of community because the part where you can build is important, right? So typically um, um, people, like, like there are many small misconceptions. Um, uh, a startup in the sense that we are talking about is uh, a, a business that is driven by engineering and not the other way around. So for example, like Google is the most valuable search company in the world because their search engine is better. It's not because they thought about, um, uh, 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 they thought about building a search engine for the first time. Um, so, so in that sense, right, um, I think it is very applicable that hackers can build engineering um, products that that can be scaled via software, um, scaled via the internet, and can reach large markets very quickly um, without much um, uh, uh, operating expense on serving that market, like like a service, for example, like a consulting service. So um, you have to start with a team that can build. Um, two is um, you must launch quickly. Um, you must not like uh, love your idea. So like a lot of like tiny misconceptions when I had when I was in school as well as after school when I was starting up was um, I have this great idea and I want to um, build this idea. And then when I tell people about my idea, they're going to love it and then they're going to pay me to use it. But actually, you should love the problem that you want to solve and, and you should love a general set of problem which of which you may not know what is a specific problem that people will pay you for. And you should go and find um, customers to talk to and basically ask them what is that specific issue. And then after that, you show them a demo of something um, very simple and very like a basic that you've built. And then they tell you, okay, you know what, if you change it like this, like that, we may pay you or they will be like, we need it right now. We're going to pay you, but please fix it after we have paid you. Right. Um, 
so like there's this saying in YC that goes something like, uh, if it takes longer than a month to build, then it is not an MVP. Um, so that's like one of the uh, important things that we learned that uh, speed is more important than being right. And because you are probably not going to get right because you are in search of a user that needs you and, and not the not the other way around. Um, another like small, um, you know, small uh, 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 a misconception or, or like confusion I had as a student around it uh, around the time I, I was, uh, you know, graduating was that um, startups have a mythical glow about them, right? Like you're in TechCrunch, like you read TechCrunch, um, you read uh, Tech in Asia, you read about investor funding, and somehow like Google changes the world, Apple changes the world. Um, those things happen much later afterwards when you have established the fact that there is some kind of product market fit. But at the very beginning, when you are just starting, you've got to act like this is, a, this is an SME, right? Like if you start a um, tuition business, the first thing you do is to go uh, find customers who will pay you, your first five customers who will pay you like very menial sum of money and they immediately get what they want and you immediately can provide um, this uh, product, right? Um, you wouldn't go and think about, um, you know, uh, finding um, uh, uh, funding. You wouldn't go to TechCrunch and you probably um, wouldn't think of yourself as a special thing. You're like, you know what, I'm just um, providing some kind of business and people are just paying me for it. Right? Um, so, that, so that's one of the, the, the most important things um, at the beginning um, where it is um, um, uh, because you're building the software part, you kind of think that you are special, but you're not. The, the, the process towards getting revenue is the same. Later, the software helps because now you can provide services um, without too much um, uh, cost, like uh, cost of um, you know, goods. Right. As compared to if you are uh, uh, like a, uh, 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 if you're actually like making a, a real, um, uh, you know, expenditure to, 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 to provide that, that one unit of good, but with the software part or with some kind of high volume manufacturing, like uh, Apple, Apple's, um, uh, you know, products, then, then like the iPhone, then, then you can scale much faster later. But that shouldn't be your focus um, right now today. Uh, this is kind of the same point as uh, the point just now. So, like the the if you think about the best companies in the world, the best startups that you know about, like Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, all of them started in their dorm rooms. All of them started in their basements or their mom's basement. Um, you know, all of them started in a garage. Um, it is really um, prevalent um, currently. Uh, if you if you if you if you go for any of these startup events and there's a startup scene and and there's an entire area in Singapore where um, all the startups are supposed to be there. Uh, it is really um, not a very good idea to be associated with any of these things. Um, you shouldn't be an expert in startups. You should be an expert in your users, in your customers. And you should be aggressively uh, meeting um, your customers and your users. And, and, and if you don't have any, then you should be trying to find um, um, find any that wants to use your product, wants to pay for your product. And, and basically, um, um, raising funding is the last thing that you, you, you should be doing at the very beginning. So that was the four easy ones where it just gets you um, started. Um, the six, uh, the next set is the six harder ones where it's a bit more subtle and it, it, it probably happens after you have started and you kind of have, you know, been doing this a little bit where you have been launching and you have been, uh, you know, failing and you have iterated, you launch and then you launch again and again and again and you do it quickly each time. Um, then, then during this period, um, what are some of the things that you should look out for and what we learned um, when we were um, to going through the YC program. Yeah, so like one of the important things that we learn is this idea called the hair on fire problem, 
And the story goes something like, uh, if your hair is on fire, then I, if my hair is on fire and you have a broom, I will pay you money to hit me with a broom. Um, and you don't have a fire extinguisher, but that's okay, right? Because that's my, my primary motivation today is not to die with, with, the, with the fire thing. And, and, as a, and this kind of links back to the whole idea of launching quickly. Um, uh, the, if, if your first product is not um, embarrassing for you, um, if it's not shitty enough, then probably that's not an MVP, right? And this, this is something that um, YC emphasized to us all the time that we need to go find this hair on fire problem that a product that you built could solve such that you can gain that initial momentum and traction to lift this thing off the ground. And that initial lift off the ground is like one of the most difficult things um, that, 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 that you have to do. And, and many startups never even get this lift off. But most of the press and most of the language around startups almost always ignore this part because this part is not glorious. It happens in a dark place. And, um, um, and, 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 and by the time they have lifted off, um, they are now in the Wall Street Journal, the UI looks nice, the website is beautiful um, and all that stuff, right? So, so this is something that they uh, emphasize for us to go and find people who have a hair on fire problem. Um, um, another concept that we were taught a lot was the idea of um, growth. Um, growth is really very simple, right? If you have 10 users today and next week you have 11 users, you have 10% growth. That's it. And, and if you manage to maintain this 10% week on week growth, um, you will have um, um, 1,500 users in one year, in 52 weeks. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, uh, what you have to be doing all the time after you have launched something, after you have found a hair on fire problem, um, is how many more people have a hair on fire problem. And every week is just um, changing that strategy, uh, changing that strategy, change, changing those tactics to, to, to attain that 10% week on week growth. And one of the reasons why this relates to um, NUS hackers with the word hackers inside is that if you're using software, then it is possible to achieve this kind of exponential growth, right? It's 10% week on week, it's small, it's very slow at the beginning, but it becomes exponential um, after a while. And software and engineering and uh, some kind of ingenuity in, in marketing and, and, and internet-based sales allows you to have this kind of growth that you cannot do in a different kind of business environment, right? So um, this is something that they taught us that all you have to do is find that one additional user in that first week. Um, another counterintuitive thing that we, we were taught a lot is that competition doesn't matter. Um, again, because this is in the nature of the idea that you build one piece of software that can be cloned a million times, a trillion times, and can be used by a billion people or, or by thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, the idea is that if the market size isn't big enough for five to ten one billion dollar companies, then you won't even have liftoff. So competition doesn't matter at the beginning in the sense that um, um, if your market size isn't big enough, right? Then like if you have like a thousand customers, five hundred or five hundred of them, you won't find their emails. Two fifty of them, you will find their emails, but they won't reply you. Um, Another, the next 250 will reply you, but you know, they suddenly have to go on vacation and don't reply you like after the second email, right? So the idea is that um, while all these things are happening, that this competition thing doesn't take place. Um, and it wouldn't matter if you had a statistical sample that was like 100,000 companies or 100,000 users. And then in that case, like now, okay, 550,000 of them never replied or you can't find their emails and it doesn't matter. Because when you whittle it down, you still at the very end have a thousand people who reply you properly and they, you will be able to achieve that liftoff 
um, the very, very difficult lifting at the very beginning uh, and achieve that momentum. Uh, so this is something that they, they pummeled into us because a lot of um, media plus business language, um, usually that surrounds the MBA and uh, finance business, talks a lot about competition but competition really doesn't matter for a startup that is utilizing software to, um, you know, make some kind of a new product or, or make a, a, a previous process more efficient. Um, another hard thing we learned was that um, when you are building your startup, you have to measure because when you measure things, um, it tells you where you actually are and, and it tells you what you need to be doing next week. And this measurement could be anything. It could be uh, daily active users. It could be um, revenue. It could be um, um, people that you have reached out to this week. And if you don't measure this um, strongly, you won't be able to know what this is, right? Because the whole like um, 10 users this week, 11 users next week, right? Um, basically um, um, relies on um, whether or not you're measuring these metrics and what you would need to do next week, right? Because going from 10 to 11 users is one strategy where you call your friend and your friend calls your friend, but going from 100 to 110, which is 10% growth, is a different strategy because now you have ran out of all your friends. But if you don't, if you're not measuring these uh, metrics, then then internally, right, when you talk to your teammates, when you talk to your co-founders, when you talk um, to yourself, you, you wouldn't know what is the true evidence. And you would just be arguing about, you know, random stuff. And, and, and basically, you will not, you'll not be able to formulate the best strategy to do uh, what to do next week. Um, yeah, so this one is a bit um, tough to explain. Um, so we learn a lot about the idea of um, product market fit. Um, product market fit is basically the idea that, you know, you have um, made something a lot of people want, not just some people want. And if you think about the exact phrase, it's not like product customer fit. It's, it fits the whole market, not just some customers, right? It's not a service market fit where you provide a service like a consulting service where it's um, uh, every unit of um, service you provide, you have to expand a unit of costs um, instead, but instead it's a product, right? It's a replicable product that you can pass on to a user and they use it themselves. Um, and most of the problems that startups faces are all around the part on the left side. But by the time you hear of them in TechCrunch or in the news, they are over here already. Right. And the moment you are here, um, um, you don't have to, there, there's nothing, I mean, there are still problems, but 99% of startups fail on this side. And the, the problem is that um, many people build a company before they build a product because the media talks about this part of um, companies like say Garena or, or C Group or Google, Facebook, they are already here. And, and, and you keep hearing about, you know, employee management and, and you know, um, compet competitors, uh, uh, funding, and none of these things matter, right? Because you're not there yet. And, and most people don't report about this part. And, and, and product market fit primarily means you iterate fast enough um, within the bounds of your runway before you know you run out of money or before or, or you become profitable in some way where you can actually sustain your burn um, and you you iterate so many times such that you eventually find some market and you are able to build some product that 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 basically gives you this lift off right yeah so um this trough of sorrow, for example, I, by the way, this this graph, right, is um, frame in in the YC um, Mountain View like main room with uh, on the wall, and it was basically I think first drawn by Paul Graham or somebody, um, one of the founders, um, to explain like most startups are in this trough of sorrow, and and the. That the worst part of this trough of sorrow is not that you are in the trough of sorrow, but you don't know whether you are here or you are here. And you could have given up here 
and you kind of given up, given up here as well. Um, and you probably won't be giving up here, but, but this is false. This is just, you got into TechCrunch and, and a huge number of users like come to your website and then you, you feel happy for no, like, but, but none of them converted or they, some of them converted, but churn, like they just stopped using your service like after a month. Right. So, so this is, uh, uh, something that we learned that we have to be, you know, uh, uh, aware of and mindful of. Yeah. Um, and the last thing um, I learned uh, was about communication. So one of the things that we practice and YC a lot was this thing called the one-liner. Like if somebody asks you what your um, company was doing, then you must be able to explain in in one line. So for example, for Traverse, our one-liner was. We help you find the best wind farms on this planet. That was the one liner. And in YC, we had a communication style where if you should always talk about the most important thing first, and you shouldn't talk about things in a chronological order where, um, 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 and then you should unravel from that most important thing backwards. Um, and it kind of cuts through a lot of bullshit and it, it allows you to uh, uh, you know, immediately surface the most like uncertain things that you no longer can, you know, uh, plan and think about and, and has reached the level where you're rolling a dice. Um, and it allows you to have faster communications, more effective communications. So um, the another like set of communications that we also were taught was to have uh, communications and conversations between your team members and between founders. And it's called the three levels of con conversation. Um, so like level one is casual conversation and it's just, you know, it's not about feelings. Um, the more risky level two conversations are about work, uh, what we're doing, uh, the what's and the, and the how's, for example, um, almost always without vulnerable feelings, just very, you know, surface level feelings. And the most important one is to have these things called the level three conversations, uh, which are the most vulnerable. And it's not talking about the what and the how anymore, but more about what I feel about about doing this particular thing or or, or events that are occurring to our startup. The, the reason why these um, three levels of conversa conversation is important and why it's very important to have level three conversations is the majority of the time in a startup, you are in a you are in a, a position of risk you are in a hazy nebulous bubble where every path is plausible that you could do, but you don't really know if you should do it or not. And everything has some kind of opportunity cost. And that kind of like uncertainty doesn't produce like positive emotions. It produces um, doubt in yourself, um, you know, um, a, a, a feeling of being in danger um, and and, and when, when you work together with multiple people and you cannot have these level three conversations, then everyone has their own primitive fear and doubt within themselves, their own primitive emotion. And, and you need to be able to say this out loud and, 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 and be vulnerable and be able to review that this is what I really feel about this thing. And by doing that, you then can, you know, um, um, solve, uh, you can like pay back this emotional debt and, and actually be able to effectively solve the technical problems that you face because now, you know, between your team members, you know, at what everyone is feeling. Um, and, and that, that like that has consequences into what the actual technical solution, um, transpires to be. Uh, so yeah, so that's the overall 10 things I just wanted to share. Uh, you can uh, email me uh, anytime you want at ted at traverse.ai and Startup School, which is also run by YC, is a very interesting place to get started um, and you can check it out. Uh, it accepts everyone and, and there's like around 30, 40 hours of lectures on there. Yeah, so that's the end of the, the, the talk for me. All right, yeah, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, that was really... Um illuminating um, a lot of perspectives I never thought uh, I would get. I think I love the uh, point number nine, right? the graph you, you drew, uh, the one that uh, Y commented, that was like, yeah, that was 
really something because we mostly think about this a promised land, right? Because whenever a startup comes in the news, it's always good news. It's never bad news, right? They don't publish bad news. Uh, yeah. with, when it comes to startups, that's the paradox. Uh, but yeah, uh, really interesting perspectives. Uh, we'll open up to questions uh, soon. Uh, if you have any questions, put them on the chat uh, or just think of them. Uh, but before that, I wanted to ask, um, I think a couple of questions with Ed, um, just so I want to get a bit of a perspective on some stuff. Uh, I think the first one was, uh, you talked about the fact that it's very important to, to iterate a lot. You know, you must keep changing um, your strategies to keep changing your uh, perspective and so on and so forth. Uh, I was wondering how uh, Traverse in particular evolved at Y Combinator. Like, so in that three months, uh, was there any kind of change you all had? Like, did you all change the way you did things or change your entire like ball game? What, what, what changed for Traverse? Okay, so I think before YC, um, we were um, timid, meaning, um, uh, we thought ourselves as a bit of, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're building this um, um, uh, uh, this particular software that people people will use as a tool and they'll pay us a SaaS fee, right? But on the first day of YC, I think um, it was Sam Altman. And by the way, Sam, Sam Altman co-founded OpenAI. Sorry, I forgot about it just now. Um, and basically, Sam said that there is more money in the world and there is ambition and he challenges all of us to be more ambitious and i think like one of the primary things we 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 realized was that we were not selling a SaaS software we were selling a, a an intelligence um like we're, we're selling some kind of treasure map and the only way to validate whether or not our treasure map really finds treasure was to um, 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 actually go and dig for the treasure ourselves. So we changed a lot on our business model on, on how we communicated to customers from uh, selling a tool to selling a partnership and telling them that um, uh, we are not just another vendor that you hire, but instead a, uh, a partner that you can work with and we will be as if, you know, it will be as if we, we are on your team. And later on, when the project is successful, we take a share of the project together. So that that like opens up a whole can of worms. Um, but it kind of just you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, it, it 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 is how it is um, in in that sense. Um, so so that's like one example in which um, we like iterated a very subtle idea. So. For example, we, we built this entire super cool like front end, right? Um, where you could like, I, I, I can't show you anymore because I took the server down, but you could run a star search on this thing. Like you could click two points and then it'll give you the shortest path between these two points. Um, and, and it'll do this kind of squiggly road that goes up and down the mountains, right? And we realized that people don't need this, like this front end, but instead they need, um, a different kind of like um, sales um, um, motion. Um, so that's like one example in which um, we, 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 we didn't know because we didn't talk to users for the 18 months we were building this uh, Angular V1 front end that was horrible um, and now nobody uses it. <laughs> and if we talk to customers earlier, we'll be like, and, you know, practically what they want is a partnership and maybe they want some PDFs. They don't want to click around um, this complex UI. Um, and then later on, like in the last month, we had another like customer who told us they do want a UI, but not something that is interactive like this. They want a UI where they can input like things into the into the uh, like like actual like variables like uh, the wind speed here is four meters per second. They want to put in the number four, and then we, they want us to send them back a PDF. So like these subtle ways in which the user, um, um, even if your product does the, uh, the exact same thing, but the way in which the user wants it delivered, right, is also like affects your programming, affects your coding, and affects your product um, um, development. And I think it's very important to, to be like, have your, have your finger on the pulse on the user so that you can, you can give them what they want and they can pay you. Hmm. That's quite interesting. So it's like a, quite a paradigm shift in how you pitched yourself as a company to other people. Um, looks like the engineering effort was always there, but you 
totally change the way you uh, the service you provided to other companies yeah uh, so that makes me wonder right uh, didn't you all hesitate about changing this changing this entire thing because you might be you might have wondered that okay what if we just uh, keep the uh, interactive ui thing for some time some time and that might take off you know at what point do you make a switch to um, or what made you take this switch like what was the final straw that made you take make you go okay let's let's junk the entire interactive front end and let's go for the um, partnership route what's the final straw there um i think it was um more like when we had our very first uh, customer with a financial institution who wanted to use this, um, they basically said, um, cool, cool login, but can you please send me a PDF? And then after that, we tried to onboard people. Um, so, so the very first customer already asked for a PDF right out of the box, but don't forget, we already spent 18 months on this, right? Then the next second, third and fourth customers, right? When we try to teach them how to use this thing, it was incredibly hard to onboard them. And they keep sending us like data rooms, for example, like a Google Drive um, link, right? And then they're like, all oh, our data is in here and we want a PDF, right? We want a report that that go comes back. Um, so that's one of the ways in which um, we realize, you know, um, if we keep doing this, um, the, the the cost of onboarding them is so high um, and they kind of uh, just uh, fall off just because of the complexity of the onboarding right so that's like one okay. one thing uh, another thing we also i traded on is that we i traded out of um, hydropower and we i traded into like say wind because the market size for hydro right was much um, smaller than wind it was really difficult to do um, um, sales um, by just like a customer um, lead acquisition and, and, and finding out who is developing a hydropower plant and at what um, speed. Um, whereas the solar and wind markets were much, much larger, like maybe one, two magnitudes larger in terms of people who are actually building plants or just looking for something to do, right? Something to build. Um, so that could also have been figured out without us like building this entire thing um, so much, yeah. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So it's like a bunch of perspectives that um, made you push over the line. Hmm. Uh, we have another question uh, from one hand and uh, he asks, um, he was wondering how you would talk to your customers if your business wasn't B2B. Oh, hmm. okay. So you mean like a B2C thing? Yeah. I'm guessing. I think that's what they mean. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that, that, like in NYC, we had boot camps for this like different like uh, uh, streams. So, so all the B two B companies went to one boot camp and the other one went to another. Um, you talk to your customers um, primarily through the idea that if a great startup earns users by word of mouth, like your friend, uh, 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 somebody who uses your software tells another friend about it right and 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 primarily if it's a b2c company um, whether or not your product is working um, centers around how much organic marketing um, is achieved by people telling um, um, their, their their network on on to to use your software and if if um, nobody is doing that right like let's say you, you launch this thing and 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 people are not um, doing that kind of organic marketing, but instead you're paying through the roof for ads and whatnot to use your company, um, then you probably um, have to make subtle changes and subtle, um, 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 you know, uh, uh, differences in 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 what you are building, and, and you have to launch it again and again. But but the the the, the nature of iterative launching in a B two C company is very different compared to that of a B2B company, where um, let's say for a B2B company, I may have to take two months to build some feature out. But for a B2C company, like say in the case of Airbnb, it could just simply be in the past, there was no way to rate the place that you stayed at, like no five star, one star, two star, three star. And then in the future, uh, you just added that, that, that feature, that, 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 that one thing in, uh, I mean, you could argue that that could also take two months to build, right? But, but you can you can say that you know that that now depends on how fast your team moves, 
And if you're measuring your metrics, you're measuring your, um, you know, all your all your um, um, user um, uh, 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 intensity and uh, activity metrics on your screen. You are watching your users using like software like say uh, 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 Full Story. Then you can see how people interact with your software and and how whether or not and you can A/B test it right whether or not this particular feature um, will have uh, made uh, made any difference. And actually, for Airbnb, the the whole rating um, five star thing um, is sort of set like one of the original um, like one of the first team uh, 10, 10 engineers of Airbnb gave a speech to us um, to tell us how to measure B2C um, activity on their websites. And they said that the five star thing, right? If they didn't do the A-B testing correctly, it might have led to Airbnb dying. Or maybe he was uh, exaggerating it a little bit, but that's how, that's how you would do it for a B2C situation. Right, yeah, that's quite cool. Um, the fact that, you know, a simple feature like adding reviews could make or break uh, a business when it's B2C. Um, yeah. Do you think yeah. that Traverse as a B2B business has less of a margin for error? Because I realized that uh, for Traverse, if you all go from 10 users to 11 users, right, that can actually be a bigger jump than for a company to go from like 1,000 to 2,000 B2C users. So, you know, not all user, users are created equal, right? Uh, yeah. So I think Traverse is like, even within YC, we were a little bit of a pariah. Um, YC is more along the the, the lines of you know selling um, um, rabbits and uh, deer, meaning they are ACVs are like um, um, you know um, um, hundreds to thousands to um, um, maximum like ten thousand uh, uh, a year kind of companies. Um, there, are, there were very few enterprise YC companies that were selling at 100,000 a year. Um, so we were a little bit of a pariah in that sense. And therefore for us, our iteration speed is much slower than the, the uh, average like uh, standard YC company um, that, that joined the batch. So um, for sure you, you are right there, you know, one of the reasons our investors, for example, funded us or our users use us is also because I am an industry insider and I, I built like power plants for a, not quite a number of years. Um, so this one is a bit of a founder market fit thing, founder product market fit. Um, and to be able to build, say, like the hydro and wind stuff, right, you need to know wind specific technical details, right? Such that when you, uh, 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 when you turn up at the uh, customer's engineer's office, you are not like asking them stupid questions like, um, how does wind speed translate into energy? You know, things like that, you already know. Um, so, so I think that's a little bit different. We are like an extreme case where we are like a much like more enterprise kind of um, company. But even then the spirit of the things that um, um, I mentioned here, right? Still doesn't, um, still applies. It's just that when a B2C company is iterating in a two week span, we are iterating in a two month span, but we can't be iterating in a six month span. That, that does make Traverse rather different um, since it's a, it, it's a startup that requires a lot of technical knowledge, right? Like the people who are investing need to know about what they're doing. It's not like a totally black box thing as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that brings on our next question, which is from Edward himself, who was the first speaker. Um, he asks, uh, uh, so many great German knowledge in here. And then he asked, uh, what's the biggest mistake you made and what did you learn from it? Uh, hi, hi, Edward. Um, um, so let me think what's the biggest mistake. I think I have made too many already. <laughs> um, to, to, um, let me think, I think it's probably, um, uh, being enamored by the idea that, you know, we are making a big difference in the world and therefore, you know, our company must be presented in a certain way, which if you see this UI, um, I mean, you can you can like kind of judge for yourself. It's it's a little bit too slick, right? It's it's made of many um, complicated like um, um, you know folding structures and and uh, a lot of tiny tiny parts. Like this one has an entire C plus plus backend to it that allows you to find out how to excavate this road. 
Um, uh, this one, I think, has a, a wait, a power generation, flow duration curve. This one is water stations across the world, like every part of the world we have water stations so that you can estimate project flow. The user wanted none of this. They just wanted a PDF, right? Um, and that's primarily because I was enamored by the idea that, you know, I got to look like this cool company, whereas I should have been more enamored by who's going to pay me, right? Like right away. Um, and, and can I just send them just this graph and they'll pay me a hundred bucks? If they will, then that's great because tomorrow I can then sell them something for 200 bucks and I'll know exactly what they buy for 200 and the next day 400 and the next day 800. Um, so I think that's like probably one of the biggest mistakes you can you can make. In, 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 in my situation, it's more of an enterprise situation. And in, if it's not an enterprise situation, then, 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 then just building too much is always bad. Right. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor? Uh, if not, uh, I think it's 9am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll probably wrap up here. Uh, if anyone has any more questions for that, uh, that maybe you can flash your email again on oh, the sure. slide. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so it's simply just ted at traverse.ai. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, uh, maybe you would prefer to like, ask that directly. Maybe you can yeah. drop him a message. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Thank you, everyone, for coming down today. But before before uh, uh, your leave, uh, uh, let me share my screen. Oh, what? Uh, So uh, hope you can give us some feedback for uh, the two sessions today and let us know if there's any other kind of events that you'd like us to conduct. So uh, scan the QR code. And next week, we're going to have uh, Ming from Legalese who will be presenting on coding legal contracts by inventing a new language, which I, which I believe is a domain-specific language. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the details, but I'm looking forward to it. And finally, uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Edward and Ted for coming down today and sharing and hope uh, you have learned something uh, I definitely did from both talks. And yeah, uh, I'll leave this screen up for a little longer. So, uh, and if anyone has any questions, yeah, if anyone has any more questions, just feel free to continue and leave them in the comments or something.